Last time, I talked to, about, to you about controlling and manipulating atoms in quasi-one-dimensional states. These we originally produced by photo-exciting the D states, potassium D states, in the presence of a weak DC field that was sufficient to mix the D state with the neighboring highly polarized <coughs> stock states. We then talked about how having gotten a quasi-one-dimensional atom, we could induce transient phase space localization in it by giving it a kick towards the nucleus. So at this time then, the electron probability density was maximal towards the outer classical turning point. And then starting from that, I showed by giving additional kicks how we could then make it into a highly elongated, very high end, quasi one dimensional state. How we could lock it into a drive field and then navigate it in phase space, moving it up to higher end, back to lower end using chirped kicks. And I also talked about how you could use the quasi 1D atom as a vehicle to study some of the theories of classical chaos. Now what I'd like to do is to make the situation the next most complicated. We've done the quasi 1D, now I'm going to move on to 2D atoms. So I'm now going to start talking about controlling and manipulating high-end wave packets that are in near circular orbits. They're moving, say, in the X C plane. So we have now a wave packet that is confined to a two-dimensional plane. The work I will describe represents the image of a lot of people and is a mix again of theory and experiment. The experiment is undertaken at Rice University by myself and several students, past and present. Zinwei is here, so if you need to know more information, ask her. She's sitting just there. She'll be able to tell you. And then we have again a very valuable theoretical collaboration with Joachim Bergdorfer's group at the Vienna Technical University. Whoops, too, too many. Okay, so why are we doing this? Well, we're starting out with n about 300 Rydberg, about n equals 300 again, and we're using these atoms as a way of investigating protocols to engineer localized wave packets that move in near circular orbits. In other words, an electron wave packet that sort of mimics classical electron motion, as in, for example, the Bohr model of the atom, or as in the motion of the Trojan asteroids that are associated with Jupiter. We're also, again, as I commented last time, high-end atoms you would expect to be fairly classical. You could describe them then using classical mechanics. But even at high-end, as I will show, quantum effects rear their head. And in fact, we'll see quantum effects <coughs> such as revivals. Another thing we'd like to do is, since we can see revivals, we can maintain coherence over extended periods of time. And then we can look at dephasing and decoherence in these mesoscopic systems. Also, I will tell you about how you might be able to input information and retrieve it in our near circular states. And as always, it's just interesting to look at the classical limit of quantum mechanics. How does the classical world emerge from the quantum world? Now, the apparatus we use is very similar to the apparatus I described previously. Again, we're working at very high end. The electron is a long way from the <coughs> nucleus, so it experiences a very small field from the nucleus, so its motion can be strongly perturbed and even dominated by even modest external electric fields. This means that we have to reduce the fields down to less than about 20 microvolts per centimeter. We can do that using the apparatus shown here. And the way it works is the following. We start out with a collimated potassium beam. We excite atoms in that beam to a quasi one dimensional state using the cross output of a frequency double rhodium 6G dye laser, which is focused here. We actually operate the experiment in a pulse mode. So we chop the output of the laser into a series of pulses of about one microsecond duration with a pulse repetition frequency of about 20 kilohertz. Following each laser pulse, we can apply pulses, pulsed electric fields to the atom using one of these two electrodes. So we can go in the Z direction, or in this case, the X direction by pulsing on the fields. <coughs> We then determine how many atoms survive the pulses by field ionization. 
for which purpose we apply a ramped voltage to the lower electrode, which produces a ramped electric field here. And as the atoms ionize, the electrons are collected and detected by an electron multiplier. Now we start out by producing strongly polarized quasi 1D atoms. This again is a classical distribution. So this is now a spatial distribution. The nucleus is here. The electron probability density <coughs> is all over to one side. So we excite the selected start states, which are strongly quasi one dimensional. There's one problem I sort of forgot to mention last time, and that's associated with the hyperfine splitting of the ground state of potassium. Potassium has two hyperfine ground state levels, one with F equals two, one with F equals one, and they're separated by 461 megahertz. This means then, as I tune the laser, typically I'll get two Rydberg excitation series, one originating on the F equals two ground state, the other the F equals one. And you see here, you get a series of large peaks, they're associated with excitation, N equals 275, 276 from the F equals 2 ground state, and you get a series of smaller peaks which are associated with the excitation of N equals 274, 275, etc. from the F equals 1 ground state. So you've got two interleaved liquid <laughs> spectra, which just makes it difficult to select a particular state. If, however, you go to about n equals 3 or 5, that vicinity, you find that this collapses to a single series of excitation lines. And that results because in this vicinity, the spacing, say, the excitation of the n equals 3 or 5 level from the f equals 1 state corresponds to the excitation of 307 from the f equals 2 state. So you can simultaneously excite n and n minus 2 states. Now these have similar spatial characteristics and similar start shifts. So if we apply an electric field in this situation, you just get the one D state derived excitation feature here. And you can produce then quasi one dimensional Rydberg atoms. The only problem is you've got two values of N. So it's a little difficult to excite just a single N state. Now we started out then with a quasi one D Rydberg atom. How are we going to make it into a near circular two dimensional state? The way to do this is simply to apply a transverse DC pump field. So we suddenly turn on a transverse field, and then we ask, well, how does the atom evolve? And that is illustrated here. Let's say then that we start out with a highly elliptical quasi 1D atom aligned with the x axis. So this is the x coordinate. We pulse on a transverse electric field, say, in the z direction. And the subsequent motion of the electron classically looks like this. It starts out highly elliptical, it becomes less elliptical, and as time goes by, it becomes near circular, and if we let it continue, it becomes more and more elliptical, and finally ends up highly elliptical in the opposite direction, and then continues becoming circular once more, and we're taking the opposite direction, then back to elliptical. So if you look at the component of angular momentum in the perpendicular direction, which of course is the y direction, then what you see is that Ly, the y component of L, undergoes a series of periodic oscillations. It remains narrow, it oscillates sinusoidally. The trick is, if we wait just for half a start period, when we get to here, we've got a, di a narrow distribution of very high L sub y states. So if we suddenly turn the field up at this point, we freeze the atom in a circular state, moving in the xz plane. And you get a wave packet that looks something like this. It's distributed around the circle. Now remarkably, if you just wait a certain amount of time, this wave packet will localize in azimuth. So if you wait a little while, you see the following happens, and this is simulation. We've applied a transverse pump field of 20, 20 millivolts per centimeter for 22 nanoseconds, turn it on. And what's shown here is the subsequent evolution of the wave packet for times from about 7 to 10 nanoseconds. And what you see is it's become very strongly localized in azimuth. And you have a localized wave packet now, which as time proceeds, is moving anti-clockwise around the nucleus in a near circular orbit. 
So what we've essentially done is we've created a localized wave pattern that orbits anti-clockwise. This mimics very closely the original Bohr model of the atom, where you have this localized electron in a circular orbit. Now, it turns out the Bohr model was proposed almost exactly 100 years ago. And it took about 100 years before, experimentally, we could make a realistic realization of that Bohr model of the atom within the limits set by the uncertainty principle. Okay? So the question then becomes, what's the origin of this azimuthal focusing? Why does the whole wave packet localize at one point around the orbit? This can be understood relatively straightforwardly and results from the fact that when we turn on or off the pump field, there is an energy transfer delta E, which is given by the product, just the stock term, Z times the magnitude of the field. Okay? Now, when we turn the field on, the state was oriented along the x-axis, so Z initial basically was zero for the wave packet. However, when I come to turn it off, the wave packet is distributed around the circle. So when I turn the wave packet off, there's a distribution of Z coordinates. Okay? So this means there's going to be a distribution of energy transfers. Now the distribution of electron probability around the orbit peaks at plus or minus R. It peaks here and it peaks here. Okay? So I'm going to get then because I have a distribution of initial z coordinates, which looks something maximum, goes down, comes back to a maximum, I'm going to get a distribution of final end states because of this range of energy transfers that's going to be peaked at these extremes. We'll have a distribution, we'll have Rydberg states within max formed here and N min formed here. So these extreme components of N are formed on opposite sides of the nucleus. Now, these two groups of different end states evolve at different rates because they have different time dependencies. And if you wait just about the right amount of time, which is given by pi over the difference in the two evolution frequencies corresponding to n max and n min, you will get a localized wave packet. One component is caught up the other component, they overlap, and they now go around together. And you've got a localized wave packet. Does this really happen? The answer is yes, you can check it by monitoring the evolution of the wave packet. You can do this two ways. If you have a localized wave packet that's moving around in Z, the Z coordinate of that wave packet is undergoing periodic oscillations, and what you can do is you can see those by measuring the coordinate of the wave packet by applying a field step. I talked about how we could do this last time. You pulse on an electric field suddenly for about two orbital periods, and then you turn it off. And since when you pulse it on, there's an energy transfer that depends on where the electron was initially located, if the field is big enough, then you will get an ionization probability that will also depend on where the electron was when you turned the field on. So here what we've done is we pulse a field on as a function of time after we've had the pump pulse to make it circular. Then we look at the survival probability and we choose a field such that the average survival probability is about 50%. And you see what happens is you see a buildup of strong oscillations in the survival probability which corresponds then to a localized electron wave group moving around in a circle. I also have data here, not just in black, but in red. The red is when you look in the x direction to see what's happening. And as you would expect, you get strong oscillations in the orthogonal direction. And there's a pi by 2 phase shift. So you can see the fact that you get the phase shift you would expect. You can also see that it's a circular state by looking at the wave packet is going around. As it goes around, the component of momentum, say, in the z direction changes. So if I give it a kick, if it's going this way, and it's coming this way, and the kick goes this way, it's going to lose energy, so it's going to be bound. If it's going another half period, it's going this way, and I kick it, I kick it in the same direction as the motion, it gains energy, so it will ionize. And therefore, as a function of time, the ionization probability will have periodic oscillations, and in fact, that's what we see. Now, the problem, of course, is that what you see is the wave packet is nicely building up to a strongly localized wave packet. The components, of course, subsequently evolving at different rates spread out, 
and you lose this. So you lose the localization. But the interesting thing is, if you wait long enough, you recover the localization. You get strong periodic revivals. Here's that initial strong oscillation. Now we wait several hundred orbital periods, so these are now 500 nanoseconds and microseconds. But then you see a strong revival. Now this is a purely quantum mechanical effect, and it results because after a chime t given by 2 pi divided by the difference in the frequencies associated with the energy space in the n minus 1 and n, and n and n plus 1 levels, those components move back into phase modulus 2 pi. Okay? So at these times, which scale as n to the fourth, everything comes back into phase, and we get these revivals in the beats. <coughs> So what you can see is we can actually then see these quantum beats, revi these revivals, at late times. So what we are seeing here then is that we can maintain the coherence of these wave packets on microsecond timescales. Remember these wave packets are mesoscopic system. They're tens of, micro tens of micro um, microns across. So what you see here is that even at 300, you can see these quantum effects. They're a little easier to see here if you kill the high-frequency noise in the data, but that's sort of a cheat. However, there's a problem, and that is that these revivals occur at relatively late times, which are longer than the Heisenberg time. So you're not going to see this using classical mechanics, okay? Because you have to you can now resolve the quantum structure, and classical mechanics doesn't have any quantum structure. So to see these, you have to, we have to use quantized CTCM simulations. So what we do is, you use CTM, classical trajectory Monte Carlo calculations, to follow the evolution of the wave packet, while you've got the pump field on to make it circular, and immediately you turn it off. Then what you do is, you get a distribution of energies at turn off, and you discretize this, okay? So the final classical action you get is quantized, and you use the integer part of nc plus a half. So instead of having energies of one over two n squared, you have one over two, one over n plus a half squared, okay? That's done because the classical and all classical orbital frequencies agree better with the quantum frequencies, and in fact, to of order 10, n to the minus four. So having discretized the final energies that you've got, you adjust the phase space coordinates, so you just rescale them to the appropriate energy. And then you can say, well, does this work? So we'll compare quantum and quantized CTMC predictions for n equals 100, where you can do fully quantum calculations. And what you see is something like this. What is shown here is the time evolution of the expectation value of the z coordinate of the electron. We start out with a state with n equals 100, a quasi 1d state, and it has a parabolic quantum number k of 83. That's characteristic of the kind of quasi 1d states we produce. That parabolic quantum number k is a measure of how strongly polarized the atom is, knows how big its dipole moment is. So we start out, and now here is the time evolution of the expectation value of z in suitably scaled units as a function of time. The green line here is the result of quantum calculations. You see initially the buildup of these strong oscillations in the coordinate z, which gives these strong oscillations we see in survival probability. It goes away, and then it reappears. Here's the beat, and another revival, and it goes away and comes back. Now you notice that when the revival occurs, it goes to zero in the middle. There's a kind of double revival, one here and one here. What's the origin of that? The first one is when the wave packet is localized, say, here. Now, that localized wave packet has two components, a high-end and a low-end component. They move apart. So if I wait a little bit longer, the high-end and low-end components are on opposite sides of the nucleus, and their motions cancel, so there's a very small oscillation in CO2. <coughs> but a little bit later, they move back into step, and then we get back to large oscillations in, Z, in the Z-coordinate. Now you say, well, why doesn't that happen in this region? Well, each of these peaks themselves have a distribution of n, so as time goes by, those two peaks themselves broaden out 
and then they come back and relocalize. Okay. If you just do a simple classical trajectory Monte Carlo calculation, you reproduce very well the initial expectation value of Z, and there's no revival. Okay, so you don't see any revival. So then what you do is you discretize these levels before you consider their free evolution after the pulse. If you do that, you get the red line, and that's in pretty good agreement with the quantum calculations. So this quantization works rather well. Also, you notice that you have now data extending over long periods, so you can do a Fourier transform of this. And when you do that, you find the number of frequencies that correspond to different values of n. So you can now do, then, if you like, Fourier transform spectroscopy, and you can get out single n resolution. So this is a very nice way of doing it. Now the question, of course, is that's theory what happens in experiments, and this is shown here. Here are the quantum beats that we see with the revival. Initially, remember, we've got a localized wave packet. This region here, if it's spread out, it's distributed around in all angles out of angles of azimuth. Here it's localized on opposite sides of the nucleus. Here again, it's relocalized. Okay? So this was data with a mix of 303 and 305 and a pump field that was of moderate strength, 5 millivolts per centimeter. And again, we're using a probe field to monitor the time evolution of the Z coordinate. Here is, the reason, here is the theory that we would expect. And you see that experiment and theory agree pretty well. So we get strong revivals at places where the CT quantized classical trajectory Monte Carlo simulations predict. And if you look at the Fourier analysis, you see two peaks. <laughs> One around about 302, one around about 307, 308. So that's what we would expect, because remember when we turned the field off, we expected to get two groups of n states. n max over here, n min over here. We expected the distribution of states that would have maximum and minimum. Okay? And that's sort of what you see. Now, using the fact that we can now get, using Fourier transform spectroscopy, single end resolution, you can probe subtle changes <coughs> in the n distribution. And what we've done here is, here are quantum beats observed after we've used pulsed fields to produce circular states of 10 millivolts per centimeter, 5 millivolts per centimeter, and 2.5 millivolts per centimeter. Now, as I decrease the size of the pump field, the energy difference between the n max and n min states decreases. That's what you would predict, okay? Because the field is less strong. The difference in the, in the start shift from here to here is then going to be less. And indeed, that's what you see. If you take a Fourier transform of this, you see a distribution of end states that is relatively broad. But as you reduce the field, you see that distribution narrows up. And in fact, ultimately, you've only got a few states populated, okay? Now, the Fourier spectrum like this, I have to come clean and say it's a measure of the width of the end distribution. It doesn't give you the true end distribution. This is illustrated here. Here are simulations of the end distribution, so n is across the bottom, when you have a 10 level per centimeter field, 5 and 2 for the pump field. And you see, as you observe, the width decreases as the pump field decreases. If you look at the anticipated similar simulated Fourier transform, it's not flat. You see there's a dip in the middle. In all of these calculations, there's a dip in the middle. The reason for that is that when you produce states of n max, they're all initially located on one extreme of the orbit. The n min are located on the other extreme. But states that are initially on the z-axis, which have little energy shift, are formed on two sides. But they orbit at the same rate, so they go round together. So there's very little change in z-coordinates associated with that motion, because one's going up while the other one's going down. Okay? So they don't give big Fourier transforms. You have to go to the higher order moments of the Fourier transform to see them. But you notice that very nicely, what you see experimentally agrees very well with what you predict. Okay? Now, we can get very good information about the end distribution, at least with single end resolution, within limits this way. And this suggests that there should be ways then to narrow the end distribution. 
Remember I talked about the fact that we've got these groups with n max and n min. Let's say that I want to narrow the distribution of those states. Well, I can wait for this time when these two groups of n max and n min are localized here. Now, let's say there was a time when n max was localized here, moving anti-clockwise. If I give it a kick in this direction, it loses a little bit of energy. So this high amount of moves down to lower energy. This one, which was the one that was highest in energy, if I kick this, it, sorry, this is the one that was lowest in energy. If I kick it, it gains energy. So it moves up in there. So I can narrow the end distribution by giving an appropriately sized kick at this time. Does it work? Well, yes. Here's the Fourier transform. Before we give the kick, <coughs> after we give the kick, you see how it's narrowed up that distribution? If we kick the wrong way, uh oh, it broadens it. So you can see that you can then make minor, per vary the um, end distribution of these circular wave packets. Now, thus far, we've been talking about the amplitudes of the Fourier components. But you can also re retrieve phase information <coughs> from the Fourier components. Now remember, we're dealing with wave packets that you can represent in terms of hydrogenic states with appropriate amplitudes and time-dependent phases. Now the wave packets we have are special. We have wa a wave packet for which all the values of n <coughs> are about the same. They're all about n initial. If we consider motion in the xy plane, and to do that I have to pump in the y direction, then we're all going to have very large values of L, which will be of the order of n because they're near circular, and m will be of the order of L. So we have a distribution of states here that with m about L about n, and they're all about the same. Now, in principle, you could in input information into the wave packet by controlling the amplitudes and the phases by how you engineer the pump field. If you do that, can you get information out about the phases? And the answer is yes. You can get it from the expansion coefficients in the Fourier transform. Now, the expansion coefficients, and we're looking at the variable, we're observing the expectation value of y, the y coordinate of the electron as a function of time. Those coefficients are given by this. y of t, the expectation value of y of t, contains the diagonal <coughs> matrix elements, and these are, these are really between adjacent near circular L states, N states and L states. So this is a very limited set. And then we'll have phases. Now the phases will depend on the difference between the two levels. So you'll have something like e to the minus, the difference of the initial phases, plus something i to the omega n of t, where omega n is determined by the energy difference between the two levels. Okay? Now, when I multiply this by this term here, this e to the minus i in t, that goes out. So what you get from the Fourier transform is you get the initial relative phases of the various components of the wave packet. Now, does this actually work? The answer is yes. What we've done here is we started out by creating atoms with n equals 303 and 305. We put on a pump field in the y direction that's relatively sizable. So n max minus n min, the distribution of n around the orbit, is 5 to 6, which is bigger than the n separation here. Here are the quantum beats that we observe as a function of time. Very nice. Here then are the corresponding amplitudes of the various Fourier coefficients. This is experimental measurement, simulation, and this is just obtained by looking at the time evolution of y and t. And what you notice in the low end feature here, there's a relative phase of minus pi by 2. When you go to the high end, it's plus pi by 2. So the phase jumps by pi as you go from the low end to the high end components. Well, that's what you would expect. Because remember, when we switch the field, the high end components are localized at one side. The low end components are localized at the other side. Their initial phases are out by pi. So you can actually see that pi phase. Now we ask the question, OK, let's go again to the same initial states but we'll now put on a very small pump field, so n max minus n min is 2. So this state will go to 304, 
plus or minus one, so it'll be 303 to 305. This one will be 305 to 307. And then we again look at the Fourier coefficients, and you see that just two, distri two n distributions, and they're very close to space, so we have very few n. And look at the phase shifts. On this one, minus pi by two, we suddenly go up to pi plus pi by two, back to minus pi by two, and then back up to plus pi by two. In other words, we're getting a pi phase shift across each group of n, because the two now, the, each one is narrow. And that's exactly what you would expect from simulations, okay? So we can get information about the phases of the various components from the Fourier transform, and then you, in principle, can, can control these phases by shaping the pulp field. And then you could, in principle, put in information and then get it back out, okay? Now, since we're seeing quantum beats at late times, that means we're maintaining coherence out to late times. <coughs> now what we can do is we can study how we might get rid of that coherence by putting on things like noise. Now to do that, what we deal with are not initially quasi 1D states, but we use NP states. We can get much bigger signal levels of NP states than we can get in quasi one-dimensional states. So we start out here with a 305p state and a pump field of 5 millivolts per centimeter. Here's the evolution after application of the pump field of the total angular momentum of the system as a function of time. And you see it's undergoing periodic oscillations. This is just the magnitude. The distribution of L remains narrow, so you've got the majority in large values of L. The difference is that if you look at the Y projection of that, you see it's a very broad distribution. It's going from plus 300 to minus 300. And the fact that some are plus and some are minus means you've got counter-rotating components. So it's not as simple a picture as we had before. How do we understand that? Well, remember, we're starting out with p-states. So classically, a p-state is a distribution of high, of very strongly elliptical states whose orientations keep continuously changing. Okay. So let's consider now that we <coughs> apply a pump field along the x-axis. Okay. We'll take the z-axis to be vertical, the y-axis to be horizontal. <coughs> if I start out with a quasi-1D state, which is oriented along the minus z direction, then this is going to precess in the x-z plane. We end up with a circular state after half a star period, rotating in this direction, which is actually counterclockwise in the XZ plane. So the L is along the Y axis. If I start out with a quasi 1D component in the opposite direction, it again possesses in the XZ plane, but now it's going clockwise around that orbit, so its L is in the opposite direction. If I start out with one at some other orientation, defined by the Runge lens vector A, then you will get precession in the plane defined by the pump field. And <coughs> you end up with a circular state, but its angular momentum vector no longer points in the y direction. So what you get is a distribution of values of L. So we have counter-propagating components. Now, these two counter-propagating components start out, right, and they're going around <coughs> like this. So you've got two counter-propagating components that are running in opposite directions. So what happens to the z component of the electron position as a function of time? z being vertical. Right? It oscillates because the two are in staying in step. So here it's big, here it's intermediate, here it's small. Intermediate big. So in the z direction, the expectation value of z of t is oscillating, going up and down. Right? What happens in the orthogonal direction, in the x direction? Cancel because one's going this way and one's going this way. So you see no quantum beats if you look in the x direction. But as long as you look in the z direction, you will see strong oscillations then in the function in the position as a function of time. So you can in fact see quantum beats provided you look in the correct direction. So here are the quantum beats that we actually observe. Now you've got to be a little cautious because they're not as strong as you saw when you started out with the quasi 1D atom, but the signal rates are much higher. Here is the result of a calculation using quantized classical trajectory Monte Carlo simulations. <coughs> okay. 
And then what we do is we look at this first signal here at the first revival, and we use that as a way to probe de decoherence introduced by noise. Now, we don't have a signal generator that will produce white noise. So we have to produce what is called, what is called colored noise. And we do this by having a pulse generator that bins time in units greater than 300 picoseconds, that's the minimum. And then in each of these bins, it randomly assigns plus V or minus V. So we have a random sequence of plus V and minus V. But it has time structure. There is a characteristic noise frequency, which is one over twice the time bin. Because that would be the first bin goes up, the second bin goes down, and then you come back where you started. You've got one period of the square wave. So there's a characteristic frequency in the noise. It's not a white noise spectrum. And the frequency spectrum of the noise is then controlled by this bin width, delta t. And here are data obtained when these characteristic noise frequencies were chosen to be 50 megahertz and 250 megahertz. And these are, this is that first revival when there's no noise present. You see, you get a nice quantum revival. Okay? And then we start turning up the noise field. And you see, if you use 50 megahertz, when you turn the field up to about 200 microvolts per centimeter, it's pretty much gone. It's certainly gone with noise at 400 microvolts per centimeter. At 250 megahertz, if you put on 100 microvolts per centimeter, it's pretty much gone. And it's certainly gone by 200 microvolts per centimeter. So the revivals then are very sensitive to noise. So noise can induce strong dephasing, strong decoherence. Okay? Now, the rate of this depends on the frequency you notice. Here I can put on much higher voltages, much higher fields, before I destroy the coherences than in this case. Okay? In other words, it depends on the noise spectrum. And 250 megahertz means the characteristic frequency of the noise matches pretty much the Kepler orbital 